Wow, The Huntress is definitely my new favorite Kate Quinn book. I have read The Alice Network and The Rose Code, but this book was hands down my favorite. The multiple POVs and timelines kept me engaged, and there was also The Hunt and Mystery. This was well-written and well-researched. Thank you, Kate Quinn. So let's dive into the plot, characterization, and the themes of The Huntress. As previously mentioned, this book has many POVs and characters that are just... This book has three different timelines and three different points of view. The constant switch between characters kept me on my toes, but also made me excited to read more and engage with these stories. Also, the constant jumps between the past and the present were fun to read and explore. For this episode, we will talk about the characterization and the plot in tandem since the POVs were separated until the end of the book. Each of our three main characters is largely characterized by the events that are discussed in their timeline, so it makes sense to combine these two ideas together. If she had a camera, she didn't need to tell stories. She could tell the truth. The first storyline we follow is Jordan McBride. Jordan's story was so fun. She starts this book as an 18-year-old girl and ends it in her 20s. This is largely a coming-of-age novel for Jordan. She's developing her sense of self separate from her parents and what they want and trying to figure out what she really wants. She reminds me of Charlie from the Alice Network. Both of these girls were young who have lived their lives under the thumb of their parents. And in both of these novels, they're able to break out and explore the world through new eyes. Jordan is a photographer. She sees the world through a lens, both physically and metaphorically. She is gifted at capturing people's natures and understanding who they are through a series of pictures either taken in her mind or in her camera. This was such a fun narrative. Pictures tell stories just as much as words, and I've always been a big fan of photo essays. Jordan starts this book as a girl and ends it as a woman. It's not her rollabout in the hay that makes her a woman. It's her ability to take care of herself and her sister, and make her own decisions. By the end of this book, Jordan is aware that she doesn't want a normal life that her father thought was best for her. And again, like Charlie, she follows her heart and her passion instead of what her parents wanted. Interestingly enough, also like Charlie, Jordan finds her way through the help of an older woman mentor. However, unlike Eve and Charlie, Jordan's relationship with her mother, Anna, was a bit more complicated. Jordan was the first to learn that Anna was a Nazi, but then she doubts herself. Anna tells a story of her past that sounds plausible. Jordan has told herself stories before when her mother passed away and believes she's doing the same thing again. Instead of believing in her gut thoughts, she's gaslit into thinking she cannot trust her gut. It is this incident that takes Jordan off her initial path. However, after Dan McBride's passing, Anna put Jordan back on the right path. The relationship between Anna and Jordan was an interesting one. It's clear that even though Anna's primary objective was staying alive, she still developed parental feelings for Jordan. Anna cared about Jordan and was good at judging her character. She could see what Jordan truly wanted and tried her best to make that happen. It must have been difficult for Jordan to discover that the woman she'd come to rely on had portrayed her so deeply. Anna and Jordan were very similar. Both women were great at observing people's characters and getting to the bottom of things. It's just that Anna used her power for evil while Jordan uses her power for good. Jordan's storyline comes to a climax when she learns that the person she thought was her stepmother was actually a Nazi and she goes to save her sister from the woman who actually kidnapped her instead of saving her. Jordan learns that her gut instinct was actually true, and she starts to follow it. The next storyline is that of Ian Graham. Graham's story was the story I found myself gravitating towards because his storyline was the moving plot. Nita and Jordan were great characters, and their stories were also moving to the climax. 
However, Ian's story was the one driving us towards Anna. It was driving to put everyone together. Ian Graham is your typical Englishman. He's reserved, practical, emotionally distant, and stubborn. Ian has his set of values that guide his work, and he sticks to them. I honestly love that about him. It is difficult to be the rule keeper in a group of people who are always wanting to break the rules. Ian is driven to Nazi hunting when he finds Nina in Poland and learned that his brother was killed by a Nazi named the Huntress. From that moment on, he dedicated himself to catching Nazis. At the beginning of this novel, he has found three Nazis in one year, which doesn't sound like a lot. And he and Tony are working together to bring these men and women to justice. This is not a high paying job or even a job full of glory but it seems to give both of these men purpose. During this story, Nina, Tony, and Ian work together to find the Huntress. They come up against many walls, but together they overcome all the obstacles that are thrown in their way. Nina challenges Ian to come out of his shell and break the rules. Their relationship was definitely one of my favorites from this book. Maybe even this year. She was born of lake water and madness. The last storyline is of young Nina. Nina's story was the most inspirational story of the book. Wow. Just wow. This arc followed Nina from a young girl to a young woman who grew up during World War II era Russia. Nina grew up near Lake Baikal in the middle of nowhere. Her father was a drunk and all of her siblings grew up and moved out. So Nina largely had to fend for herself. Her father always said, that it is stupid to fear nothing, and that she should have one fear. So she made her fear drowning. One day, a pilot came to Baikal, and Nina begs him to take her away. Then she joins the flight club and becomes one of the best pilots in her area. She reveres the female pirates in Russia and hopes to join their ranks. After being rejected, Nina works hard to get recruited. She uses every last time she has to go to Moscow and is accepted amongst the ranks of the female squad led by her idol, Mariana Raskova. It is there that she joins the Russian Air Force and meets the love of her life, Yelena. Things are difficult for Nina, but she also loves this life. She lives for the rides and lives for her pilot. Unfortunately, all good things come to an end when Nina's father is taken by the secret police and they come for her as well. Nina runs away from the army and finds Ian's brother, Sebastian. The two of them team up until the huntress takes Sebastian's life and almost ends hers as well until she hides in the lake. Nina is strong, brash, and fun. She must be a good time at parties, but I'm not sure I'd want her at my house. As the story moves to the climax, all of our characters are brought together to fight the infamous Huntress. Jordan comes looking for Tony to give him something when she stumbles in their apartment to find all the information about Anna. She writes Ian and Tony a note, telling her that she's gone to save Ruth from Anna. When she comes back, it's clear that Anna has found out Jordan is on to her. They have a confrontation in the dark room, and then Anna gets the best of Jordan and runs. I honestly thought that might be where the book ended. However, I'm so happy we got the ending we did. Nina flies the four of them to the lake house, and the four of them confront Anna one last time. Each of them gets to say their piece before the most epic moment of this book happens. Nina appears out of the lake and almost kills Anna, but then decides better, and Ian sends Anna back to Austria instead. In the resolution of the novel, everyone has found happiness. Nia and Ian decide to stay together, at least for a year. Also, Tony goes back to Jordan and agrees to help her take care of Ruth. It's a happy ending for all of them as they go find their new family. Of course, my favorite moment is when we get to see Eve again. At the end of the Alice Network, it is said that Eve went to go hunting. Now, Nazi hunting made so much more sense than actual hunting. I could see Eve and Nina becoming fast friends. 
All in all, this book was excellently done. Quinn moves seamlessly between three timelines and intermixes them all in a way that was brilliant. I was impressed by the research that must have gone into this book and the quality of the characters. So let's take a deeper look into the topics that are covered in this book. The thing that ties all three of these stories together is the idea of the huntress or the lake witch known as the Raselka. As I was listening to an interview with Kate Quinn, she talked about weaving these three stories together, and she also said she made up Lake Selkie in Boston, and that lake, there might be a lake, but it's not called Lake Selkie. However, I do love this underlying idea of the lake witch. She even named the huntress Lorelei after the origin of the lake witch story in Germany. The fact that Anna was afraid of the lake witch, even though she was named after one, was a bit of irony. It also ties back to the group of women called the Night Witches. Quinn talks about how the Night Witches were real and how Nina was a compilation of all of them. Nina herself didn't exist, but a number of women like her did. Witches have always been feared by people because they are women who are unafraid to make change. The women in these stories were unafraid to live lives that were contrary to the status quo. They lived their lives how they wanted to and didn't let anyone else tell them how they were supposed to live. So in that way, they were all witches, especially Nina. Nina grew up believing that she was a water witch because of the stories her father would tell her. However, when her father tried to drown her, she said that she even feared the water, even though it should have been her greatest power. As we see in the novel, Nina's greatest fear is being rejected by people again. Since leaving Russia and losing Sebastian, Nina hasn't made a commitment or settled down at all. So her fear wasn't really water. In fact, she overcomes both of these fears at the end of the novel. And that leads us perfectly into the next theme, which is love. There were many romantic subplots in this book. There was Anna and Dan, Nina and Yelena, Nina and Ian, Jordan and Gareth, and lastly, Jordan and Tony. That's a large number of romances for 400 pages. Each of these relationships were intriguing and taught us something about love. However, we're not going to unpack all. Instead, I will point out some of my favorite moments. Let's start with my favorite quote. Jordan considered. He knows how to look, really look, when a woman is talking. Ah, her stepmother sighed. Some men oogle, some men look. The first make us bristle, the second make us melt. And men are at an utter loss knowing the difference, but we do. And we know it at once. Exactly. Jordan handed her a plate to dry. Did dad know how to look? It was the first thing I noticed about him. He could admire an a lady as though he were admiring a beautiful porcelain vase without making her feel he was affixing a price tag. End quote. Jordan spends a large part of this text with a man she doesn't love. Aerith represents everything that Jordan was supposed to want, a man who would provide for her with a suitable future, someone who became more of a friend than someone she felt passionately about. Then she meets Tony, which is where we got the quote from earlier. Tony knows how to listen and understand. He's caring and observant. This is the kind of man that Jordan wanted, a man like her father. Although Anna may have taken advantage of Dan McBride's kindness, he was truly a good man. He looked past people's flaws and was willing to accept them. That was the kind of person that Tony was, and Jordan knew deep down the person she wanted as well. The next connection was between Yelena and Nina. Here's a quote about Nina's love. So maybe falling for Yelena wasn't hard to understand after all. She was fine and fierce, keen and courageous, the best flyer in her regiment. With a roll call of qualities like that, Nina would have lost her head over Yelena, whether she was a woman or a man or a plant. To Nina, it was exactly that simple and not worthy of any further thought. Yelena never really accepted Nina's love. She felt that what they were doing was wrong and unnatural. However, for Nina, her love was natural as loving anything. Nina loves with her heart and not with her head, which is a beautiful trait. 
However, it's clear that Yelena wouldn't have made Nina happy long term. Nina didn't want to be a mother who sits at home and takes care of children. She lived for her life at war and thrived on the hunt. Yelena didn't want that. She wanted a nice, calm life in the city. That is why I love Nina and Ian together. Nina and Ian were my favorite partnership in this whole novel. Nina pushed Ian to face his fears, and Ian taught Nina restraint. A good partner brings out our best qualities. Nina reminded Ian what it was like to be uninhibited and to chase something with his full force. And Ian reminded Nina that there's something worth living for. The two of them both loved the hunt. They had similar goals, and they were okay with living a different lifestyle. I honestly love the two of them together. Here's a quote that shows their relationship. I'm only saying that I will find you mad wolves to hunt, Ian told his wife, and that I will never break your heart. If part of that heart was always out of reach, that seemed entirely fair to Ian. You did not get a whole heart when you pinned yours to a splendid, battered, high-flying hawk like a night witch. Nina's soul would always, in some deep place, yearn to be soaring under a bomber's moon with her dark-eyed Moscow rose, and that was fine, end quote. The relationships in this book teach us the importance of true partnership and that love is about more than just what is on the surface, which leads perfectly to our next idea, which is that of appearances. Anna and Jordan are masters of stories and appearances. However, as we know, Jordan uses her power for good, while Anna uses her power to take advantage of others. Both of them could look past what a person was on the outside and capture who was on the inside. Here's a quote from Jordan. If she had a camera, she didn't tell stories. She could tell the truth. One idea I thought this book did a great job at addressing was the ability for people to hide and flee the war and their war crimes. After World War II, the United States was thrown headfirst into the Cold War, and it feels like people quickly forgot about the crimes of the Nazis. It's easier to ignore their crimes and move forward with the new enemy than to think back to the atrocities of the past. However, this book reminds us the importance of looking at history and remembering all of the atrocities so that we can build a stronger future. Let's look at how this book addresses that with this quote. The dead lie beyond any struggle, so we, the living, struggle for them. We must remember, because there are other wheels that turn besides the wheel of justice. Time is a wheel, vast and indifferent. And when time rolls on and men forget, we risk the circling back. We slouch yawning to a new horizon and find ourselves gazing at the old hatred seeded and watered by forgetful and flowering into new wars, new massacres. These are powerful words that focus on the importance of seeking out truth so we don't have to repeat this awful thing again. Here's a quote about this. She's at least one thing that's right going forward. Building a generation is like building a wall, one good, well-made brick at a time, one good, well-made child at a time. Enough good bricks, and you have a good wall. Enough good children, and you have a good generation that won't start a world-enveloping war. So many historical pieces focus on this idea. The idea that we cannot repeat the things that have happened in the past, and we must do the best to teach the next generation how to move forward, to make them better so that we can avoid the pitfalls of the past and not let history repeat itself. Overall, this is one of the best novels I have read this year. It has romance, mystery, suspense, and it was all based on real-life experiences and people. You really cannot ask for anything more. This book was well-researched and well-written. If you love this book, you will love Kate Quinn's other novels, so make sure to stay tuned in the next upcoming months as we unpack The Phoenix Crown. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of According to Your English Teacher. I would love to connect with you on social media, or feel free to send me an email. My email is at yet 
A-T-Y-E-T-33 at gmail.com. Or you can find me on Instagram at according to your English teacher. I would love to hear more of your thoughts about this book or any of the novels we've been reading recently. Also, if you like this episode, please make sure to leave the podcast a review or give this episode a thumbs up. That would mean the world to me. I would like to leave you with one last quote. No one likes to talk about their war after it's fought. They want to forget. And what happens when they die, and they've taken all their memories with them? We've lost it all, and we cannot. This episode was written by me, Sam Gunther, and edited by Dallin Gunther. The music was produced by Tom Brinton. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and please stay tuned for next week 